Whether you're listening on your favorite podcast app or watching on YouTube, welcome to the Lions Roar podcast brought to you by Lions Roar, a nonprofit media organization offering Buddhist wisdom and guidance for mindful living to benefit our lives and create a more caring and just world. For more, go to lionsroar.com, and if you enjoy this episode, subscribe so you don't miss future ones. Today, we're thrilled to invite you to participate in BuddhaFest 2024, an online festival presented by Lions Roar. This year, BuddhaFest is dedicated to celebrating women in Buddhism. In the following conversation, from BuddhaFest 2024, Executive Director of the Buddhist Film Foundation, Gaetano Maida, explores the intersection of film and Buddhism with Sharon Su, President of the Sakyadita International Association of Buddhist Women and author of Silver Screen Buddha. Together, they discuss the importance of telling women's stories through film, the profound contributions of female filmmakers, and their own experiences watching this year's selected Buddha Fest films. This special event runs from July 15th through August 26th. Your festival pass includes access to nine talks, 14 Buddhist films, musical performances, and more. Register at BuddhaFestOnline.com. Discover embodied compassion with Karuna's 2024 to 2026 basic training program. Start your journey today at KarunaTraining.com. My name is Gaetano Maeda. I'm executive director of Buddhist Film Foundation, and our international Buddhist film festival uh, programmed the film for BuddhaFest. And this year's theme is Women in Buddhism. I'm delighted and honored to have with me today uh, Sharon Su, and she is a remarkable talent. She is a, a professor of theology and religious studies, as well as the um, a uh, Wisner Professor of Gender and Diversity Studies at Seattle University. She is president of Sakya Dita International Association of Women in Buddhism and the author of Silver Screen. Um, what's the subtitle is Buddhism in Asian and Western Film. Welcome, Sharon. Ah, thank you so much for having me, Tano. Oh, it's a delight. I, I really mean that. And um, I, I have a, a feeling that uh, your mm, experience with our program of films uh, is going to be very, very helpful uh, for our um, audience there at Budapest. And so you, you've got a chance to watch a few of the films. I, I know uh, it's, a big, it's a big task. Um, what is your impression? Well, so far, um, absolutely incredible and exciting um i've been watching these films i've watched about oh about six or seven of them in a row as a way of giving myself a kind of concentrated uh, viewing experience and i have to say that you know with the the films like karma and honey giver and as well as the documentaries i feel like i've gotten a great um, visual introduction to women's uh, flourishing in the Buddhist world, and that Buddhism looks really different when it's focusing on women and also primarily female directors. Um, just the the choice of what to 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 film has um, just expanded our understanding of of what Buddhism looks like. Well, yeah. I I like that you noted that um, uh, of the 13 films, uh, all but one of them was either produced or directed by a woman. And most of those women are, in fact, themselves Buddhist practitioners. Yeah, I think that makes a huge difference um, in terms of the choice of what to, what to focus on, uh, the different kinds of Buddhist teachings that are conveyed through the films and in so many ways, much of what we've seen um, in other Buddhist films has really been what I like to call a male tale, you know, a story of a, a man's enlightenment, often to, at the expense of women. And so we know that women are often seen as a kind of uh, downfall of men, not only in Buddhism, but basically most world religions. But in these films, we see something really different where women are the protagonists in the film. And one of the things I love about the films that were selected is, is simply that none of these 
films show a, a vision of women as these exotic, mystical beings, but these women are really grounded in the everyday experience of being Buddhist. And so I think that provides such a different and more expansive understanding of what it means to be Buddhist. So I'm very excited about the films that the audiences will see. Well, you know, one, one of the things that um, in selecting these films uh, that is always in the back of my mind, is, is this a, um, an entertainment or is this a teaching or is this a journalistic exploration? Because there, it's a different tonality. Uh, when one or those one or the other of those uh, approaches is taken, and um, these differ, and it, it, among them there are big differences in in the approach that they take. But I think that um, uh, in general, the documentaries uh, have a, a journalistic tone. Uh, the, the the there is a uh, a journalistic ethic uh, at work, uh, which is to say a certain honesty and um, uh, clarity of, of, um, of uh, access and things of that nature. Very big difference when we have uh, films that are scripted, fictional uh, works. Karma and Honeygiver are two uh, fictional works. And I wonder, you know, I, 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 I've been delighted to show those films a variety of times over the years. And audiences are different about that. I wonder what your take is on those two in particular because they're scripted films. Yeah, you know, one of the benefits of not being um, a filmmaker is that I don't worry so much about the distinctions between a documentary and, um, you know, a, a film like Karma and Honeygiver because for me, I like to think about these films in terms of, you know, first of all, you know, what am I, what am I feeling when I watch a film like this? And so last night I was watching uh, On the Road and this wonderful documentary about these Korean women who've decided to become Buddhist nuns and seeing them from the perspective of um, new practitioners and when I watch a film like this, I, I get very excited because, you know, there is that kind of journalistic view of, you know, here's what Buddhism looks like, or here's what the experience of a novice might be. But at the same time, it's also giving me a sense of seeing the world through this particular Buddhist lens. And so documentaries are indeed journalistic in that regard, but for me, they also provide a very intimate picture of what Buddhism looks like through this particular lens. And so in that way, you know, I would say for myself, the kind of ignorance of is, is blissful for me in terms of noting the subtle distinctions and the, the key points of documentary. For me, it's, it's a visual kind of landscape that helps me kind of, it, it gets really exciting for me because I think about like, what am I understanding about what Buddhism means? Because it, it changes based on what I see. And when I try to relate to these women who, for example, in On the Road, I, I was so touched by this young woman who has to practice her chanting voice. And at some point, one of the senior nuns, it really encourages her to work on it because it doesn't sound so good. Or how to uh, beat the muktak in a way that is, uh, you know, incongruence with Buddhist teachings. And I loved that point of the film simply because I have often been so worried about my own chanting voice. And so I connect to the film in that way. And so they're very um, intimate for me. And they also, I, I cannot help but feel a certain kind of resonance and a certain kind of empathy for the different um, characters in these films. Well, it's interesting you pick that one out um, as well as in reference to Karma uh, and um, Honeygiver because they all touch on a monastic life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Karma, of course, is about a monastery and nuns and an adventure. And Honeygiver is about a missing abbot, abbess mm -hmm. uh, from a monastery. And so there is a, a context of, of monastic life 
uh, unlike, say, for instance, um, the Meredith Monk film, Inner Voice, uh, or the Lucia uh, Riker film, uh, 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 Buddhist Boxer, uh, Boxer Buddhist, uh, where you have a, a um, uh, non-monastic uh, 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 protagonist uh, who is committed to uh, her practice and yet functions, you know, one as an artist and one as a, uh, a professional athlete. Uh, in very different ways than um, monastic uh, life would offer, and um, much more typical, perhaps, of a Western um, uh, context than, say, an Asian context. But um, uh, I think, uh, you, you know, in in those both of those films, the the um, experience of being a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. uh, the experience of being committed uh, to a practice and to integrating uh, this practice with a, 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 a real life uh, is vivid. And I think there, there is, it, although they're, they're not monastics, I think there's a, something uh, equally uh, uh, compelling and deep about their connection uh, to um, their, their teacher, uh, their practice and and the um, uh, the the need to uh, fulfill a their lives without having a separation, without a duality between uh, the two. Yeah, I, I love that you brought those two films uh, up together, uh, the Meredith Monk film and uh, Lucia Riker that documentary. Both of them are so wonderful because. When I watch both of them, you know, I see these kinds of Buddhist teachings of presence. So Meredith Monk, you know, she makes this point in her in in the documentary where she sings but without words, because the use of words requires a kind of rational, dualistic um, theorization, which takes her away from the present. And there's something really powerful about that. And with Lucia Riker's film, we see this boxer, this kickboxer, somebody whose whose livelihood relies on a certain kind of violence, and yet the Buddhist teachings have encouraged her and taught her how to find herself in a different way. So I I found that to be really compelling and exciting, and the two of them together, uh, watching these two documentaries together, for me are, are wonderful because they give us an insight into a lay Buddhist women's practice, which we really don't see a lot of. You know, historically, I think in text as well as many of the films, lay Buddhist women tend to be on the margins. You know, they're accepted as the material sustainers of the Sangha, but in many ways, we don't see them as main characters in the story of Buddhism over time and place. And so these two films really provide us with this intimate understanding of how Buddhism has helped uh, transform suffering, right? And both Meredith Monk and Lucia Riker really highlight the different forms of suffering, whether it's suffering from death in the family or death of one's partner, and or suffering, just um, racialized suffering. So we see a lot of the ways in which Buddhism has helped uh, women not only let go of parts of the self, but also embrace parts of the self. And one of the exciting things about these films is that we see that Buddhism is not always just about denial, right? It's not about losing the self all the time. Sometimes we need to embrace the particularities of the self, especially for women. So I was really excited about those two. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, both of those films um, uh, over the years have uh, stimulated some commentary and occasional controversy, especially as you know, uh, the, the um, profession of Lucia. Uh, whose whose life uh, has changed since that film was made. She's no longer obviously uh, uh, performing as a, a boxer, but she's actually she trains uh, young women, uh, and she brings them into um, their um, sort of uh, opportunities that wouldn't exist otherwise. And of course, uh, she's she has a, a, a deep connection with her her home people. Uh, which is in um, 
uh, Asia, but she is fully uh, assimilated into uh, a Dutch uh, a life and um, a community. So she's an interesting figure. I'd, I'd love to see a follow up of that film. I'd love to see a sequel. Uh, and um, the same thing with Meredith. Meredith is, you know, she is now a um, uh, one of the classic elders in the in the art world, and and of course in in the whole um, say Maha Sangha. She's well uh, known, deeply appreciated by many. And uh, follow up for her would also be interesting. That film uh, includes wonderful sequences from some of her work, oh, yeah. uh, her 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 stage work. And she's done some incredible new uh, stage work, and I hope uh, it's been well documented. And perhaps we can look forward to uh, a new film about Meredith Monk, um, uh, so that that her her work, which is uh, we could say avant garde uh, in in the sense that it's not mass marketed, and uh, uh, you have to make an effort to uh, see it, engage with it in in a in a, in a public uh, performance. But a film may be a little more accessible, and that's actually pretty much a definition of what we do, which is to make these lives uh, more accessible using film, uh, because film is a little more um, uh, widely uh, distributed, and um, uh, we might be able to uh, to connect with different audiences because of, of cinema itself. Yeah. You know, uh, just a, a couple of remarks about the those two films that really appealed to me also was this notion of discipline, right? So Meredith Monk, we see her work. It's so profoundly disciplined. It takes a lot of discipline to be so avant-garde, right? And so there's, for me, I see such deep practice. And it's not the kind of the practice that we might see in On the Road, um, where we have a number of Buddhist nuns that are meditating for hours on end, sometimes in just a room, one meal a day for 30 days, or maybe even up to three years. So that is one uh, very uh, recognizable form of discipline. And then in Meredith Monk's film, we see so much about her discipline as an artist and her practice and her practice and continual refining and refining so that she can be free in her work and her work can transcend these kind of traditional boundaries. And I see that with Lucia Riker as well, this kind of disciplined practice of working out, going to the gym and just over and over and over again so that she can be spontaneous, so that she can be uh, free, whether it's in the boxing ring, which is kind of a funny thing to say, you know, as, as, um, we see in the film, she's this contrast between Buddhist and boxer. But I think by the end of the film, we see that they're really not contradictory, but rather deeply uh, enmeshed. And so I, I, I think that those themes are some of the most prevalent ones for me that I was really excited about. Embark on a transformative journey with the 2024 to 2026 Karuna Basic Training Program. Over 20 months, immerse yourself in contemplative psychology through meditation, online and in-person learning, and group retreats. Engage with a supportive cohort and experience mentors starting September 15th, 2024. Open to all seeking personal growth or professional enrichment, this program helps you develop compassion, navigate emotions, and gain deep insights. Join a global community and earn 97 CE credits through CAMFT with 262 training hours. Go to karunatraining.com to start your journey today. Well, you know, uh, two of the other films that you've seen uh, are about teachers. And that's a, that's a whole new um, uh, uh, approach to the story of women in Buddhism. And that is, as we've seen from the last, let's say, 50 years, uh, authority uh, was always vested in uh, Asian-born men with bald heads and nice robes. And those were the authorities in Buddhism uh, as we appreciated it in the West. And slowly, uh, that authority started to spread and became uh, embodied uh, by um, um, native-born uh, teachers, both men and women, 
uh, who were not necessarily monastic and who had uh, trained with uh, the Asian teachers, perhaps, uh, but maybe trained with uh, the American students. That's also possible. But um, having women teachers with the full authority of the of the institution, whether we're talking about the, uh, the Zen monastery or the the um, uh, Vipassana uh, Center or the Tibetan Gompa, whatever. There, there are women now who have been given and earned the authority to teach. And two of the films, one of them, uh, Su Chi, uh, mm -hmm. Doing Good in the World, uh, and um, the other one, Zenju, uh, uh, which is uh, about a, an American uh, teacher. Uh, they focus on women as teachers. I wonder if you had a sense of how they differ in terms of, of uh, uh, focus, in terms of um, your appreciation of the, of the uh, characters, et cetera. Yeah. Um, well, let me start with uh, Zenju, Earth and Manuel's film. Um, you know, that film I love because, I mean, it, it's a bit older so she's moved into different spaces now but one of the things I love about that film is you know she really centers this question of you know what does Buddhism have to offer black women and I think just asking that question this is the question that her sister had asked her and I think that that is such a profound question because you know, the easy answer is, oh, well, there's a lot of suffering, right? And the Buddha taught about su suffering and how to transform suffering. But this film, we really begin to see how that's applied to this um, American experience of race and racism in ways that are really exciting and generative. Um, Zenju's film really shows the ways that um, there's different ways to practice Buddhism that can be. Uh, culturally specific and not have to be just meditation. So there's a lot of emphasis in uh, this documentary about drumming and how drumming is a way to connect with community. And here we see Buddhism is about community and not just about a community of monks and nuns, but also a community of other uh, racialized people who have experienced the suffering of racism in the U.S. and how using a drum as, as a way of uh, embodying and creating community that can then help heal suffering is was one of the real profound points that came through for me when I watched this film. And having a teacher who, and I'll, I'll be quite honest, you know, as, as a Asian American woman growing up in this country, having a teacher that comes from the same background, from the same social location can be profoundly uh, liberating and exciting and beneficial because there is a certain kind of resonance. And I know that many folks in the US, for example, or in the West may go into a Buddhist temple or a meditation center that can be predominantly uh, white, and we might not connect in the same way. And so what I found in Zenji's film is precisely that the gift of resonance. I mean, she doesn't only um, serve uh, sanghas for people of color, but also has, has really been um, educated and taught and trained in a predominantly white sangha. But we do see that there's something really powerful about having more diverse female teachers in um, sanghas. And so that for me was, was really exciting. Um, and then we get to the Tsuchi Foundation and you know the, the master in the Tsuchi Foundation is this woman who was a young nun many, many years ago who really saw the suffering in the world. And she decided that she was gonna open up a free clinic and in Taiwan. And then it's such a, a grassroots effort led by one Buddhist nun who then gets an enormous number of other uh, Taiwanese lay Buddhist women to start collecting money. And I, I was very touched because the documentary uh, shows a group of women, young and older, putting together these little coin boxes 
and they distribute them everywhere and people give what they can. And that's what serves as a foundation for this incredible organization. You know, many years ago, I worked in Los Angeles when I was a grad student. And I remember going to a Tsuchi Foundation uh, free clinic. I was doing oh. some research and I think it was in Alhambra. And it was amazing to me that here was a free dental clinic. Um, and it served a predominantly Latino population. I don't even think there were any uh, Asian or Asian American dentists there or hygienists, but it was an, uh, a free clinic that was established and supported and run by Tsuchi. So it, it was so wonderful to see this story of this organization from really that grassroots uh, beginning and the motivation wow, there's so much suffering. She is quite unique in that she did not have an institutional base. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can understand, uh, you know, that a major Buddhist organization, let's say um, um, Zen centers of LA or San Francisco, which has, you know, history, it has resources, it has people uh, undertaking a, a project or undertaking a service and, and being able to manifest it. But she was all by herself and she envisioned this and then manifested it through, as you know, these um, uh, very small scale fundraising efforts, grassroots. And now it is one of the leading um, uh, disaster relief organizations, independent uh, uh, disaster relief organizations in the world. Yeah. When, when there is a a hurricane or an earthquake or a volcano uh, or a war, they charter a jet mm -hmm. and their volunteers don't only come wearing their beautiful blue outfits, but they pay their own way. The volunteers are, are not being paid and they're not, they're not being supported by an institutional umbrella. They are giving their time and they're, they're bearing the costs of of being involved on their own, mm -hmm. and they show up, and these planes land in, in, right in the middle, days after a disaster, and they start delivering uh, relief. And it's a remarkable organization. Uh, it, it it does raise a question, and you know this is a kind of question that um, comes up, especially now as uh, things are changing and we're all getting older. Um, is that you know will that will that organization survive her retirement and mm -hmm. and ultimately you know when she goes will there is there a succession plan in place and because she originated without an institutional or lineage type of support uh, has has it evolved there uh, in Taiwan to um, uh, to continue her work, continue her, uh, the, and she has a lot of uh, uh, monastics as well. She, she doesn't only work with uh, volunteers, she also has within that organization a monastic program, uh, which by the way, you should visit. It's, it's extraordinary to visit uh, in uh, Hualien in uh, Taiwan. Remarkable work, hospitals, schools, um, uh, an amazing uh, farming operation, a uh, recycling program. Uh, uh, the film also uh, touches on um, the uh, um, organ donation, uh, mm -hmm. which is in in Buddhism as well as even in Taiwan, regardless of of, of uh, religious uh, orientation, not uh, mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so she's she's a very special uh, uh, figure, and as the film demonstrates, somewhat elusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My my sense, my hope, and my sense is that somebody who has had such a profound, transformative impact, not only in Taiwan but beyond, and been able to inspire, you know, these clinics, and you know these first responders from all over the world, this bone red uh, marrow registry, I'm pretty sure she's got, she has a plan, you know, this incredible infrastructure. She's so detailed and so organized and on the ground in terms of 
um, overseeing or at least um, giving inf information insight into these various projects, I can't imagine that she wouldn't have a succession plan in mind. You know, it's. I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, one of the other things that people don't realize about Suchi, they own two, not one, but two broadcasting stations mm -hmm. that operate 24 7 wow. with original programming. It's it's not like it's just another you know local station like you know Channel Five which just carries I don't know CBS uh, material. No, they're producing original programming, and then there are different types. I I, I forget which channel. Um, it's called uh, Da I is the name of the uh, uh, broadcasting uh, thing. But uh, one of them is is uh, devoted to uh, entertainment. They're doing cooking shows and, and uh, uh, soap operas. And, uh, and then the other one is more news and documentary, et cetera. But full 24-7 broadcasting, she envisioned and manifested. And it's going strong. Uh, there are very few other Buddhist broadcasters uh, on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a small one in um, uh, uh, South Korea. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, there was one uh, in Amsterdam, but um, they've been con kind of con contracted, uh, contracted into uh, a, a sh a one one program per week. They used to have a full full program, but funding there has changed. Uh, and pretty much that's it in terms of public broadcasting uh, uh, with a Buddhist ownership and intention. So remarkable that she's got it up and running and um, uh, has two channels uh, full time and reaching huge audience uh, in in uh, in Taiwan. And of course, because of the broadcast and the way broadcasting is now distributed uh, in she's working in uh, Mandarin, uh, very available to um, uh, to Chinese audiences all over the planet. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that this documentary reflects so much is the inherent social engagement of Buddhism. And, you know, she the fact that there that Suchi has these broadcasting um th th this this ability, I think it is a reflection of really contemporary skillful means. Right. It's um, so for me, I look at the Tsuji Foundation as a, a very powerful and efficacious um, example of skillful means, meaning, you know, finding ways that the listeners can best um, attune their ears to. And so whether it's through different kind of shows, cooking shows, uh, soap operas, those kind of dramatic uh shows or television news whatever it is it's it's a way to attune one's ears right to things that are related to the transformation of suffering and i mean i've been fascinated by the suji foundation for decades because it really does provide such a different uh look at what buddhism looks like on the ground you know having grown up in the us my vision of buddhism has always been what's been um, shown on TV or shown in the films, which tends to be about Buddhist monks in lofty places, you know, in isolated uh, mountaintops, not really engaging in the world. And so we tend to think that that's what Buddhism is about. It's about being lofty or transcendent. And when the focus is on an Asian Buddhist nun, you know, in Taiwan, in Asia, we see a completely different side of Buddhism. Like the other side of Buddhism that's on the ground. That's not just about um, meditation in a temple. And those things are incredibly important. But this is an opportunity for lay people to see themselves as central to a Buddhist practice, as central to a, um, a community engaged and socially engaged way of being. So I, I love this that you included this particular film 
And so I wonder if I can ask you a question. Of course. All right. So we have, first of all, this is um, a film festival about Buddhist women or women in Buddhism, women of Buddhism. So I want to know, one, number one, why that theme right now? And then if you can give us some insight into why you selected the films that you did with your team. Good questions. Um, I have been wanting to do uh, a thematic festival about women for a long time. We've been doing uh, film festivals uh, for 25 years now. And um, we've shown over 350 films from 22 countries. Uh, and I have to tell you, it's only within the last few years uh, that films about women have become available, which is to say, um, it's not that we were ignoring it, it's that there were no films to draw from. Uh, film festival programming is all about what's available. And uh, in particular, this f festival, which is an online festival, uh, there are certain parameters of availability for online festivals that are different than availability for in-person festivals. Uh, current films are generally not available for online festivals because there are commercial opportunity issues uh, that uh, would prohibit uh, a uh, or preempt a, an online uh, screening prior to, say, um, in-person festival screenings or, in, importantly, from a filmmaker point of view, uh, broadcast opportunities or theatrical opportunities and um, what they call the window. And so uh, we know of a few films that exist uh, currently, but we were unable to invite them for the online festival because of these commercial considerations. So. Uh, I've been wanting to do it and uh, accumulating these films and keeping track of what was available. And um, you may know that uh, Budapest, generally speaking, uh, is is about the talks. Mm -hmm. uh, they 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 have anywhere from uh, half a dozen to a dozen um, talks uh, from Dharma teachers uh, from all over different different um, uh, traditions, etc. And the films are uh, an adjunct. Uh, we, we generally uh, look to create a thematic um, mm, uh, approach, which gives us the opportunity to dig into the repertory uh, archives, as opposed to uh, we know we can't have the current films, so we, we can dig deep and we look for a thematic uh, um, path through mm. the, the archives. Last year, we did a special uh, um, presentation about uh, the Dalai Lama. It was mm -hmm. his 88th birthday, and uh, we said, in Asia, eight, very big number, and 88, even bigger. So we embraced that, and we collected all the films. Uh, well, not all the films. We, we collected a, a selection of really good films about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So that was our theme then. The year before was Thich Nhat Hanh who had uh, recently died, and uh, we, we were able to present films about him or um, about his students or about people who were affected by him, et cetera. So we look for themes. And now we had the chance uh, to, to uh, dig deep into the women in Buddhism theme. And my selections are, first and foremost, I look for a good story well told. Uh, there are many films now or, uh, that, that feature women, but not all of them are, uh, are um, ready for uh, a general audience. Some films are made specifically for their own communities, which is wonderful. And, and everyone should be documenting their teachers, their, their, their uh, sangha, et cetera, and, and doing their best to tell the story of, um, of that world. But not all of those are directed to a general audience. And we then look for films that can reach beyond their locality, beyond their uh, specificity, uh, so that others can appreciate what, what the story might be or what the person uh, who's depicted uh, might have to offer. And um, that limits it. And we also have uh, the issue of uh, access to the proper file. 
this is technical stuff, but you know, uh, uh, filmmaking moved from uh, six, you know, 16 or 35 millimeter celluloid to uh, various video uh, formats, and now we're into various digital formats. But those are the origin of the film. Many, many, many different uh, formats exist, but there's only one format that works as we're streaming it. And that's that has means that everything has to come into that format. Not every film is is possible to do in an economical way, uh, so that it can be seen in a streaming uh, platform like this one. Mm -hmm. So there are limitations, there mm -hmm. are ambitions, and there are uh, opportunities. We try and balance those three things. Uh, I chose these films. Uh, we've shown all of these films at one time or another. Um, and we know how audiences responded to them. So we know that they have a, a, a vibrancy and a compelling uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, reach uh, beyond their original sources. And, um, and some of them are not, you know, recent, or you, you may have noticed that some of them are, have, have, uh, were made quite a few years ago, uh, but they're still current. Uh, they're still contemporary. And um, uh, I also wanted to make sure that um, the, the filmmakers were, as to extent possible, were women as well. Uh, you've seen, I'm sure, a number of films. Uh, well, I'm sure you've seen a lot of films because you wrote a whole book about it, uh, <laughs> which were made by men. And they have women characters, and some of the women characters are Buddhist women, et cetera, et cetera. But they're marginal. They're, they're not central. They're not given uh, agency generally. And um, frankly, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really feel that that's appropriate for us to support right now. I think we want to see uh, films that, that express and embody uh, the uh, the female perspective with real authenticity, and that usually means there should be a, a, a woman directing or at least producing, you know, in, in, involved in the, in the production, and uh, that's what I was looking for here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I think only one film of the entire uh, program is uh, directed and produced by uh, a man, and that's uh, interestingly enough the perhaps the most uh, female focused film, which is Karma. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'm struck by is you said that you have shown all of these films before, but perhaps not together, right? So Never, the, never together. <laughs> yeah, so the vision of Buddhism really transforms when you show all of these films together under the rubric of a single um, festival. And so... My question for you is, you know, what what do you hope that audiences will will understand about women in Buddhism or women of Buddhism based on the selection that we have in this film festival? Well, you know, it would be a little um, arrogant of me to have my own ambition uh, for the program. What I I'm always uh, interested in is uh, in supporting and promoting the filmmakers. I, I, I came to this as a filmmaker. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how it happened, but I ended up running this film festival because I, I'm first and foremost a filmmaker. And I saw that the, um, the gatekeepers were not particularly keen on Buddhist films. And I'm mm -hmm. talking about in the 1990s when I was very active as a filmmaker. And I was also um, a jury chair of uh, the San Francisco International Film Festival for several years. And I, I saw how the film festivals, you know, how they looked at films, how they selected their films. And I said, they're, they're, it's not the time for these, these mainstream festivals are not going to see these British films in the same way we see them, I see them. So that, that's sort of the origin story of the festival. And... Uh, uh, I have always wanted to find ways to connect uh, filmmakers and, and their films to audiences. And whether that means um, creating a film festival, 
or distributing films, which we did for 10 years, uh, or it means uh, helping filmmakers find funding for their productions. Uh, it's for, for, for us, it's all about uh, bringing uh, these, these wonderful talents uh, uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, materialize their visions and for that vision, that film, to be available and accessible to audiences. And so it, it's, uh, it's a delight to have uh, so many films uh, that, that give us different sort of prismatic views of women in Buddhism and put them together. Uh, and I think that does uh, accomplish the, my self-appointed mission, which is to bring filmmakers together with audiences. But um, I, I don't. I don't see. Um, I don't see that the the uh, packaging of everything together uh, is mm, a possible to do uh, in a in a different environment. I think that the Budapest uh, online environment is ideal because it gives the audience six weeks or maybe more, a little more than six weeks uh, to engage with all of these programs. And, you know, as you learned <laughs> yourself, you, you know, you can't absorb uh, 14 films uh, in one weekend, mm -hmm. which is typical of a, say, a live film festival. This is a great, great venue for, uh, for sharing uh, a big program of films, thematic basis. And I'm so happy that, um, a, that you were available to talk about this, and, and B, uh, that um, uh, the films uh, became available to us uh, for this particular uh, presentation uh, in a timely way. I, I, I'm really curious, your, your role as president of Sakya Dita, uh, which is the International Association of Women in Buddhism, uh, has a real uh, different, uh, I think, perspective on on this type of programming uh than say any any you know any any other alternative you know, your 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 professor professorial hat uh or your authorial hat but sakya deep is an important organization and um uh it attends to uh women in buddhism in a, in a very special way it's been doing it for 35 years maybe you could say a little bit about that before they cut us off yeah, yeah. Well, I see, you know, Sakyadita International Association of Buddhist Women has been this kind of grassroots effort to highlight the role of women in Buddhism as central and not marginal. And at the same time, has always been very forthright about pointing out the inequities um, that Buddhist women have experienced primarily uh, monastic women, but more and more so uh, lay Buddhist women as well. And so there is this very um, social justice oriented approach of Sakyadita. And at the same time, when you go to a Sakyadita um, conference, our next one is in 2025 in Sarawak, and we just finished the 2023 one in Seoul. In addition to pointing out through workshops and presentations, all of, many of the difficulties facing women, we also see that when Buddhist women come together, it, it, there's so much joy. And this is the thing I think that, um, you know, perhaps might be missed if we only think about Sakyadita in terms of its, um, its reach, in terms of, you know, social reform, et cetera. It, there's something that magical that happens when we bring these um, participants together in ways, as we say, this moment will never happen again in the same way. And it creates a certain kind of effervescence and an excitement. And this is what I see also with this film festival. And when you choose certain films and you weave them together, you know that I love to think about film as sutra. And we take, you know, you've shown 350 some odd films since the film festival's origin. So what happens when you self-select, you know, 14 Buddhist films focusing on women, we weave them together for a different kind of vision of what Buddhism looks like. 
And so what I see for Sakyadita and what I see with Buddhafest's uh, focus on women of Buddhism and women in Buddhism is that women do Buddhism differently, you know? And it's not that it's not as important, it's not central, but it's different. And it's different in each location and each time. And so there is this kind of generative, expansive notion of uh, women in Buddhism and this flourishing that I see both in the film festival and in Sakyadita. So my hope is that we would incorporate more films into our conferences because these are the kinds of things that bring us together that we can get really excited about. So uh, I, I hope that many of the directors that are featured in this uh, film festival are ones that we can also invite to Sakyadita. I think they'd be delighted. And I also think that the world deserves a film about Sakyadita. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm relying on you to, to make that happen. So I want to thank you for, for, for being here and uh, for, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I, we could go on for, for hours. And yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think uh, we'll have another opportunity at some point. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lions Roar Budapest for inviting us and uh, hosting us here for this year's uh, Women in Buddhism theme, 2024. And uh, I hope uh, the audience uh, gets to enjoy as many of these uh, films as possible. So thank you very much. And uh, please enjoy as many of the films as you can. Thank you. And thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening. Mission-driven, nonprofit, and community-supported, Lion's Roar offers Buddhist teachings, news, and perspectives so that the understanding and practice of mindfulness, compassion, and wisdom flourish in today's world. Go to lionsroar.com and subscribe to receive unlimited access to online articles, meditation instructions, our new Buddhist glossary, and so much more.